Hey, can folks on the chat hear me? Yes, okay. I apologize for the technical difficulties. We are doing what we can. Um, let me get over here. Here and how do I do that? Okay, that's showing up on the chat as well. Okay, great. Ah, sorry, technical difficulties. All right, so don't forget to your hand person to do the survey, come on 12, section number one, RLC 118, and we'll see the numbers. Uh, the deadline we have, the uh, uh, content videos. We have three of them this week that are due on Wednesday. None of them were as long as the analysis of four systems from last week. And Friday uh, is homework that should take homework two. I apologize for that. Um, we have three new Malta components and then one supplementary question. The uh, first group activity is going to be that we will be from tomorrow. And speaking of groups, I have successfully figured out who should be in which group based on your entry surveys. I am about a third of the way through getting getting anybody physically assigned to those in Blackboard, uh, and that'll be dealt with. Uh, that'll be finished up today, so that all of you will be in in your groups. Um, these are groups of three to four students, um, uh, all of whom have the first uh, one or two choices. The thing for the uh, for which mode you want to be using, and uh, have at least one, and hopefully as many as I could, um, times in your preferred times list so that you can, uh, if you'll have some time to work with that. Yes? Well, having a hard time hearing. On, uh, okay. Um, I will hold this up closer to me and we'll see how that works. Okay. Um, so, uh, I've also set up my office hours, and, and so I have posted to Piazza a, uh, a list that compiles all of the synchronous sessions of anything, the classes, my online office hours, and the LA sessions. This is a, uh, a hard copy version of it, but Piazza has them all as well. And each of those blue things there are links on Piazza, so it takes you directly to uh, whichever one uh, you want to go to. Um, uh, the, my online office hours are just drop-ins. So if you have some questions and you want to come by and uh, chat with me about it, just join up and, and come in. You don't need to make an appointment for those. Um, so uh, I know it's probably because I hadn't had an opportunity to really announce it um, in a class session yet, um, but nobody showed up uh, for my first one this morning. And so, you know, if you had some questions, it's a great time to, uh, to get, uh, get some questions answered. Okay, um, any logistical things before we get on to some of the money's points? Um, one, oh, one thing I do want to mention, because this weekend was so devoted to trying to figure out the logistical nightmare of dividing you up into these groups, um, I did not, was not able to keep up with Piazza over the uh, weekend. And so uh, I'm hopeful that in the next day or two, I will be able to fully catch up so that I'm back to being able to respond pretty quickly to those things. Um, and any of you that uh, still have any lingering concerns about, uh, about the assignments from last week and getting uh, the content videos working, those sorts of things, um, uh, some patience with me on getting that figured out as well. Just, just remind me on occasion, hey, I still don't have this figured out, uh, just dealt with, and I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do uh, to address that. Okay, um, any logistical things before I get on to the money's points list? Okay, I should get some paper or something to write this. So, our top muddiest point is was about identifying dipole and induced dipole interaction, dipole slash induced dipole interaction. So, the basic idea here is that 
anytime you have an electron cloud, uh, then bringing up something next to it, let's just say it's a charge, will cause the, uh, the, electrical, uh, the electrical cloud to uh, deform or polarize. So this would transition to something that looks like that, meaning that this side here becomes negatively charged and this side here becomes positively charged. So you end up with a dipole moment that looks like this. Now, you can have something similar that happens when a dipole is brought up to, uh, to an electrical, uh, an electric, a cloud of electrons. So if, for example, we brought in a dipole like this, then the electrons are attracted here. They are repelled. No, excuse me, I'm going backwards. They are attracted here and they are repelled here. So you would end up with something that may look something sort of like this. So you get a negative-ish region up there and you get a positive-ish region down here, something like this. So if, you're, if the question is specifically about identifying when is there a dipole and do dipole interaction, you ask, do you have a permanent dipole? If the answer is yes, then okay, great. Then you ask, do, do you have electrons? The answer to that is almost always yes. The only exception is the uh, hydrogen plus ion, which is just a bare proton. That's not pol polarizable, but everything else in chemistry is because you have electrons. Does that in general make any sense? Follow ups on that? Okay. So, um, our next question, how does structure affect boiling point? So, uh, we went over that several times last week, so what I'm going to do right now is sort of give you the thought process that you should uh, be following in general uh, without necessarily going into some specific examples because we did several of those last, last week. So, it is nearly impossible to determine uh, uh, relative intermolecular forces uh, without having a good Lewis structure drawn. So I would say step one is draw Lewis structure. Step two, identify any ions that are present. So an ion would be something that where you have a molecule that has a, uh, a mismatch of charge so that it's not neutral. That's all an ion is. You've got too many electrons, you've got too few electrons. Three, identify any polar bonds. When you uh, have identified whether there are any polar bonds or not, if there aren't, then you don't have dipoles. If, uh, if you do, then you could have dipoles. So, or if yes, polar bonds, and you look at the geometry. So, Looking at the geometry here means identifying whether all of the uh, bond dipoles cancel out or not. If they all cancel out, then it is nonpolar. If they don't cancel out, then you have a dipole. So at that uh, step, identify uh, whether there are hydrogen bonds. At this point, you should have enough information to compile the full list of intermolecular forces that you have. Then, 
at that point, if, you're, if what you're doing is you are comparing different molecules, you then see, are the lists the same or are they different? If they are different, then you, uh, the one that has more intermolecular forces probably has a higher melting point or boiling point. Uh, keeping in mind that some of these things can be weaker than others. If they have the same list of intermolecular forces, then you start looking at whether there is a difference in one of them or not. So water and hydrogen fluoride, for example, you have twice as much hydrogen bonding in water as you do in hydrogen fluoride. So even though they have the same kinds of intermolecular forces, water has its most important one has twice as much. Or if, uh, if they're similar except for dispersion interactions, then maybe you're going down a group in, on a periodic table. And so the, the element with more electrons is the one that would have a higher, uh, uh, have a higher bone and melting point. So that's the general procedure for, uh, for analyzing molecules and comparing them in terms of determining melting points or boiling points. Any questions on that general approach? Okay. All right. Had eight people want to know the name of the cat in the content videos. <laughs> His name is Knox. Um, there was a uh, period where all of my family's pets were named after cells from uh, the Harry Potter series. Knox is the cell that makes the lights go out. So since he's a black cat, it seems kind of appropriate. We also had a pair of rats named Avada and Kadabra for the, the killing curse, which is fun. Okay. Um, the supplementary question from last week came up again. Since we have passed the deadline for that question, why don't we actually go over that a bit? So we were comparing C, 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 N, H, H, H. Okay, uh, I of course drew it too big to fit easily uh, all together on here. Okay, so um, let's take a look at, uh, uh, I don't remember if I have these in the same order, so uh, that's the A, B, and C that were, uh, were listed. So just think about the, the structures rather than which one's A, which one's C, which one's C. Um, Let's, let's start by listing the intermolecular forces that we have that we're dealing with. So, in all cases, we know we will have one of the first forces. And because all of these have the same um, molecular formula, we would expect the one of the dispersion forces to be almost identical. Right. With one slight exception. This one is a little bit more spherical than these two are. These two are a bit more linear. So when we talked about geometries last week of certain uh, molecular forces, um, uh, we would expect these two to be able to nestle up next to each other a little bit better than we would these to, uh, to be able to. So there might be a slight higher, uh, excuse me, a slightly lower uh, dispersion force for this particular molecule. Um, may be slightly less. That's 
Good hand. Yes, it's good hand. Okay. So uh, the next question we're going to ask, uh, let's do hydrogen bonding next. In the top case, how many hydrogen bonding donors do we have? Two. Two, correct. So for something to be a hydrogen bonding donor, you need a hydrogen. And that hydrogen has to be attached to a nitrogen oxygen fluorine. So we have two such hydrogens in this uh, molecule. How many hydrogen bonding acceptors? I heard two. What are we looking uh, What feature on this corresponds to a hydrogen bonding acceptor? It's the nitrogen, and it's the lone pair that is on the nitrogen. There is only a single lone pair on it, so we have one potential acceptor here. So on average, we can have a total of one hydrogen bond. Middle case, how many donors? Just one. There's only a single hydrogen attached to, to the nitrogen. How many acceptors? One. Also one, because we had a single nitrogen bond pair. So again, one hydrogen bond. Bottom case. How many donors do we have? Okay. I can't tell if you're saying one or none. None. Correct. Zero. Because there are no hydrogens that are attached to nitrogen oxygen chlorine. So we don't even have to look at, uh, at acceptors. We have no hydrogen bonds in the bottom case. So that right there is going to be enough to tell us that this bottom case is going to have the uh, the lowest oil point, okay, because it's going to have the weakest intermolecular forces. Okay. So the only thing we really have left to look at then is going to be that whole bipolar reaction. And so the question, the first question is, do each of these have a dipole moment or not? So which bonds are the ones that we're going to care about most in this case? The nitrogen, the nitrogen hydrogen bonds, because those are the ones that have the greatest um, electronegativity difference. And so we have the uh, nitrogen hydrogen bonds. Uh, which of them is more electronegative, nitrogen or hydrogen? Nope, it's green nitrogen. So nitrogen is more electronegative, um, and that means the electrons are going to spend more time around the nitrogen, and so it's going to be partially uh, negative. And so this bond has a dipole moment pointing that direction. This bond has a dipole moment pointing that direction. Those are two um, legs of a tetrahedron. And so they do not cancel out with each other. And so this has a, uh, this does have a dipole moment where the nitrogen is going to be um, positive, excuse me, negatively charged. So we write that as a delta minus. And the hydrogen areas are going to be a delta plus. Okay. In this case, we have the same thing. We have one of them. And, uh, and so the hydrogen end is going to be partially positive, the nitrogen end is going to be partially negative. 
Now, nitrogen is more electronegative than the carbon as well, so there's going to be a little bit that comes in this way. But still, again, we, uh, if we take the carbons into account, it's still free uh, uh, levels of tetrahedron, and so they do not geometrically pull the candle out. So they will be dipole uh, uh, There will be dipole forces and dipole induced dipole forces. So, so we're not seeing a huge difference between these two, and so we might expect them to have close to the same uh, boiling points. The key difference to notice is that in this case, the nitrogen, the region where, uh, where you have the dipole, is a bit more buried inside the molecule than it is in this case. Okay. In this case, it's at the end, and so the portion of the molecule that has the dipole moment is it is exposed and able to interact with neighboring molecules more effectively than uh, than a case where the dipole moment is is buried between two sets of carbons uh, that, that are going on right now. So, okay. so you would expect there to be a slight difference, and so the dipole dipole interactions here should be slightly stronger than the dipole dipole interactions here. It's not a big difference, but it's enough of a difference that you, uh, have the, uh, you expect this boiling point to be slightly higher than it has in this one. General idea that makes some sense? Okay. All right. So, working our way down. Dipoles and vectors, which way do they point? So you have element A, you have element B, you have a, uh, a bond in between them. You look up their electronegativity. Let us suppose that B is more electronegative than A. That means that the B is going to hold on to its bonding electrons more tightly than A does, meaning that the electrons are going to be sloshing that way, mostly. So you get a partial negative on this side, you get a partial positive on this side, and so we draw our dipole moment vector looking like that. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to this question, which is related. How do you determine which element is most uh, negative? Where do we determine the value of electronegativity? So if we look at a periodic table, We know the general trends that electronegativity increases as we go across a period, and the uh, electronegativity increases as we go up a group. So within those trends, it is not always going to be obvious which trend is a stronger one. So uh, my recommendation is to, to is memorize a couple of them. Not in terms of a specific number, but just what the order is. The most electronegative element is fluorine. The next most electronegative element is oxygen. And then the next most electronegative element is kind of a tie between nitrogen and fluorine. Those two are very, very close uh, in electronegativity. The rest of them, I would look up on a table of electronegativities. I, I would not expect you to memorize the actual values. Now, you should be able to notice some trends. So if, for example, you have a compound where there is silicon bonded to chlorine, you would know that chlorine is more electronegative than silicon because they are in the same period and chlorine is to the right. Or if you have arsenic um, bonded to nitrogen, you would know that nitrogen would be more uh, electronegative because it's in the same group and nitrogen is higher than the group. Yeah, so question from Jack. They just asked if you could repeat the order one more time. Repeat the order one more time. Fluorine is the most electromagnetic. Oxygen is second. And then nitrogen and chlorine are close to tied. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Why do stronger intermolecular forces result in a lower vapor pressure? So the way to think about this is that if you have the surface of your liquid and you have a molecule here that is being attracted through intermolecular forces to neighboring molecules, the stronger those attractions are, the more energy you need for that molecule to escape into the gas phase. So when you have a, uh, uh, when you're at a, uh, a fixed temperature, a known temperature, there is a certain fraction of the molecules that have enough energy to be able to escape their, uh, their intermolecular attractions to their neighbors. That fraction will be higher the lower the amount of, uh, of intermolecular forces you have. So if you do a plot, at a, at a given temperature of the kinetic energy that molecules have. And you look, uh, you have some kind of shape that looks like this. So um, there are a lot of molecules with this amount of kinetic energy. There uh, aren't as many molecules that have this amount of kinetic energy. There aren't very many at all, but there's still some that have this amount of kinetic energy. So if you have strong intermolecular forces, then you need, say, this amount of kinetic energy in order to be able to escape. And so this region right here, these molecules that have that much kinetic energy go into the vapor phase, and that is what produces the vapor pressure. If you have weak intermolecular forces, then it doesn't take as much kinetic energy to escape into the gas phase. And so now, all of those molecules have enough energy to get into the vapor phase. And as a result, you now have a higher vapor pressure. So lower intermolecular forces shifts where that threshold is for the energy a molecule needs to get into the vapor phase. Is there a follow-up question from that? Kind of a confirmation. So with stronger intermolecular forces, it'll take more energy. Right. Okay. Ranking boiling points are looking at structure. We kind of already did that. So Okay, um, the HF H2O versus H2O H2O strength of hydrogen bonding. So we, we briefly talked about this, um, I think both Wednesday and Thursday of last week, but uh, let, let's go ahead with that. This is because of a particular homework question that I think most of you got that was trying to, uh, that was asking about ranking the, uh, which of a set had the strongest hydrogen bond. And a lot of people looked at the H2O-H2O case and said, you've got twice as many because there are two donors and two acceptors on each molecule. Um, what the question was trying to say as, and it wasn't worded very well, I wish I could go in and change it, but I don't have that ability to do that within you. What it was trying to say is for each pair, look at one of the hydrogen bonds, rank uh, that one compared to one from each of the others. And so the idea here is that there was only one case that had fluorine in it. And because fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, then that exposes the hydrogen that is forming the, uh, the hydrogen bond even more. So it's uh, much more like a, a, uh, a bare proton, strengthening the, attract, uh, uh, the attraction to the lone pair increasing the strength of that one hydrogen bond. So yes, there are twice as many in the case of water, but, the, uh, but one HFH2O hydrogen bond is stronger than one H2O H2O hydrogen bond. Uh, I will try to ensure that on exams there aren't uh, questions that are ambiguous in that way. 
Okay, any follow-ups on that? Okay. Kind of a general question, how does high school bonding work? So, you need a hydrogen. That hydrogen is going to be covalently bonded to something. We'll call that X. Can somebody here tell me the restrictions on what X can be? Nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. This has to be adjacent to a lone pair on atom Y. What are the restrictions on what Y can be? Same three, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So those are the requirements for having a hydrogen bond. Now, the, uh, how does it work, which is the, the way the question is worded. Um, I think that's, uh, uh, that may be getting at why is there this sort of special rule rather than, uh, you know, in all the other cases, we were describing uh, the interactions that we have based on uh, a general understanding of Coulomb's law and the interactions that things have for each other. Um, this, uh, the hydrogen bonding thing was, uh, was kind of an ad hoc uh, explanation. So uh, this came from looking at boiling points of the main group halides, or not halides, hydrides. And so if we look at um, uh, period two, three, four, five, and so on, and then look at the different groups. If we look at the carbon group, I'll do that in green, we saw the boiling point going up as we went down the group. Now, how do we explain that? What is it that's changing as we go down the group? So we're doing part here. So what we're doing is we're looking at carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin. Carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin with hydrogens around it. So what's, what's the uh, biggest intermolecular force that's changing as we go along that path? Yes? The boiling point is rising as the molecules get bigger. Which intermolecular force is, is driving that? They are bonded to hydrogens. They would not be hydrogen bonds, that's correct, because none of them are nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Dispersion forces, exactly. So they have the same structure, but we are now increasing the number of shelled electrons that you have. So this is increasing boiling points because of, of that structure. Now, if we go over to, say, the nitrogen group and look at phosphorus, um, arsenic, and antimony, those are going to have higher boiling points. So I'm going to think of this in blue. So nitrogen group. These are going to go like this. Now, going down the group, uh, down the group, we have the same thing going on with the uh, 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 with the increase in London dispersion forces because we're adding shells of electrons. They are higher than the carbon group because the nitrogen group is polar, whereas the carbon group is not. The carbon group, if we take our central atom, we make a regular tetrahedron. And all four bonds, uh, the bond dipole moments cancel out because it's symmetric. In the nitrogen group, um, I'm going to do phosphorus instead of nitrogen. So we can come back to, to that. We have uh, three legs of tetrahedron. 
And so this is trivial parameter. And so the phosphor sense is going to be negative and the hydrogens are going to be positive. So we have a dipole moment here. We have something similar with the um, uh, uh, fluorine group. Those are going to be around here. Um, and, and I left off the oxygen group. Here we are. And so I should have done the oxygen group here. Like so. So we can understand going up this chart in a given column based on dipole moment. We can understand going along each of the, uh, 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 the groups by the dispersion forces. But the period two ones act really weird. In fact, um, I don't remember the order of these two. Something, something's wrong about that. But so what's going on here is that that one looks weird. That one looks weird. And then that one looks weird. So what we did was we said something special is going on here. Uh, and if we look at these molecules and we look at trends in other molecules, it, uh, we find this effect in cases where this pattern is seen. So this is uh, hydrogen bonding is not something we predicted. It is something that we uh, even observed that it has this pattern. And then we went back and tried to figure out what do we think it might be a result of. And so uh, because it seems to have to do with hydrogen, hydrogen is kind of unique because it is the only element that has a single uh, valence electron. And so if that element gets covalently bonded to something with a high electronegativity, then that uh, a valence electron is getting stripped away, basically. Not 100%, because it's not an ionic bond, but quite a bit. And so as a result of that, you're left with a bare proton most of the time, which is tiny, ridiculously tiny. Anything else, that you have as part of a covalent bond at least has the 1s shell that's, uh, that's in there. Uh, and, and so the core that you're seeing is, you know, not huge on an atomic scale, but it's, uh, uh, but it's nonetheless um, it's huge compared to a bare proton. The bare protons are tiny. So, so that was uh, decided that that was probably what's going on is that there is something really special about a case where the, where the electrons are pulled away so, uh, so much from this hydrogen that you have this tiny, extremely concentrated um, region of positive charge. And that seems to interact very strongly with a lone pair of electrons uh, on, uh, on a small atom. So that's, that's the, our understanding of the mechanism. There is some uh, 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 mechanism. There is some mechanism of interaction that fits this pattern, and we think it's because the the nucleus is so small, the the core is so small on the hydrogen. Okay. Any clarifying questions on that? Okay. Uh, let's see now. Getting into. Uh, Solids. We'll do that in a minute. Let's 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 finish up with the intermolecular forces uh, stuff, and then we'll go back to looking at solids. Okay. Ranking dispersion forces, the, the carbon halides. So that this particular question was looking at, um, I believe, uh, CF4, CCl4, CBr4, and Ci4, and trying to determine their relative boiling point. And so uh, as you go the, down the periodic table, you are adding shells of electrons. And so the dispersion forces become greater. 
and uh, when the dispersion forces are greater, it takes more energy for the molecules to escape into the vapor phase. So their vapor pressures are lower, meaning you have to go to higher temperatures to get the, that vapor pressure up to the point you need it to be from oil. That, that's the thought chain that goes through from going down the periodic table to higher boiling points. Any follow-ups on that? Okay. When does polarization take place? Polarization takes place whenever you have electrons, and when you bring something up to it, that can cause polarization. That thing you bring up to it can be uh, a, uh, a charge, it can be a dipole, it can be a fluctuating dipole field, like uh, in London's dispersion forces. So, pretty much all the time. Um, Okay, the vaporization process. How, uh, so the question was worded in a way, something like, we know that when uh, sweat evaporates off of our skin, it cools us down. And so why is it that that happens? What, uh, how does this work? To understand that, let's go back to this picture right here, where we're looking at evaporation in another context where it's in the bulk of the liquid. So we said that some molecules will have enough kinetic energy to escape into the vapor phase. So, but only the ones that have enough kinetic energy to escape their neighbors are going to do that. So when this molecule here escapes, it's going to be one of the ones that's up here, right? I mean, one, one of the ones that has a lot of energy. So now, let's imagine that there are a bunch of them that are evaporating off, that are coming off. They are all going to be ones that are up here. Well, now, these molecules are still in the increasing phase. They're still colliding with each other and exchanging energy with each other. And so, some of these molecules here are then going to collide with other molecules to give them enough energy to get up here. But in doing that, they lower in energy themselves. So the conservation of energy, when you have uh, all collisions are elastic, when, a, uh, when you have two molecules run into each other, the two molecules run into each other, then if this one loses a certain amount of kinetic energy, so now it's moving slower, this one is, is now moving faster, and that one now has enough uh, energy to escape. So what's happening is that the water that remains behind gets colder, it loses kinetic energy because the uh, molecules that are escaping are the ones that have higher kinetic energy. So that's why, um, uh, that's why uh, we cool down when, uh, when uh, our sweat vaporizes, because the, uh, we are giving enough kinetic energy to the molecules for them to escape. Yeah. Does the space left over? So, um, what, what happens as it, as it evaporates is that the quantity of the liquids um, decreases, and uh, due to the intermolecular attractions, you don't you aren't left with say voids down in the middle. Otherwise, you have bubbles, and so it then collapses in. And so you now have to change the size of the liquid region and the size of the vapor region. So the vapor region expands and the liquid region contracts. So, so the temperature is defined by the shape of this kinetic energy curve, not by how many you have at any given uh, uh, particular energy. So, so if you have, if you plot this this um, uh, shape at different temperatures, at a low temperature, you're going to see something that looks like this. At a higher temperature, you're going to see something that looks like this. And at a really high temperature, it's going to look like something like that. And so, um, and, and due to something called statistical thermodynamics, which you won't get into until the 300 level class, um, uh, because the molecules are colliding with each other and exchanging uh, energy with each other, we know very precisely what the shapes of these curves are. And so, when if you did something that 
you know, locked off all of these molecules here, then these are going to rearrange into something where they have the right shape again. Okay. And so it is this shape, and in particular where the maximum is, that helps you determine what the temperature of the sample is. So what this means is that um, you have to, the vaporization process requires there to be an input of energy into the system. When it's sweat that's on your skin and, uh, and the, uh, it, you give these, uh, the system uh, the water uh, kinetic energy from your skin in order to, uh, to drive the evaporation process. You cool down, and uh, there has just been an endothermic process happening. Okay. All right. Um, let's, there was a question about supercritical forces. So this is getting into the phase diagrams portion of this week's material. Um, and so in order to talk about this a little bit, um, I've forgotten which axis. This is temperature axis, pressure axis. So if we look at our phase diagram for some random substance, there is the critical point right here. So this is the gas region, this is the solid region, and this is the liquid region. And so what we said was that um, the lines are corresponding to a transition from one phase to another. So uh, what's it called when the, we go from gas to liquid? Condensation, right. What's the reverse of the process going from liquid to gas? Evaporation. What's the process going from liquid to solid? Freezing, going from solid to liquid, melting. How about going from solid to gas directly across this line? Sublimation and going from gas to solid, deposition. Now, this line here, the, uh, the evaporation line, has an end point. It stops. The region up here is a region known as a supercritical fluid. So you're at a high enough temperature that the molecules have enough energy that they would be able to escape their molecular attractions uh, if they had the room, but they don't have the room because they're in a container that is holding them so tightly together that they're, uh, they are still in contact with each other the same way they would be if it were a liquid. So, uh, so in this region, there's not really a distinction between being in the gas phase and being in the liquid phase. And so uh, we call it supercritical fluid. Uh, something you can do from that is if we have something that's uh, clearly in the liquid phase right here, um, but at a uh, very high pressure, we then heat it up even more. We then reduce the pressure, and then we, uh, we lower the temperature. We can get from something that is clearly in the liquid phase to something that's clearly in the gas phase without ever having gone through the phase transition process. This can be useful for a wide variety of things. Um, and, and there isn't a good boundary. There isn't a well-defined boundary between liquid and supercritical fluid or between gas and supercritical fluid. It's, it's a fuzzy uh, kind of understanding of, of where you are there. The question itself on uh, Piazza 
was asking about um, supercritical forces. Um, I don't believe I ever used that word, and I have no idea what is meant by a supercritical force. So anything beyond what I've just described here, uh, in trying to understand and explain what supercritical fluid is, I am going to need a clarifying question uh, to that. Anybody have anything to add or ask about supercritical fluids? Okay. Let's talk now about coordination numbers in different lattice types. Um, this may be easier for me to not draw and for me to share a screen on the computer. Whoa, what happened here? Oh no, what I want to do is share screen as well. Okay. Okay. okay, can folks in chat see my screen? Yes, great. Uh, all right, so um, okay, so let us take a, um, a unit cell that we have of some type. Um, okay, so let's look, for example, here at the body-centered uh, cubic uh, unit cell. Um, in this particular case, what you have to do to determine the number of nearest neighbors is to identify which atom you're going to be using as your reference point. And then you try to identify which other components of the unit cell or of neighboring unit cells are the shortest distance away from it. And so in this case, it's relatively easy because in a body cubic, uh, body centered cubic kind of arrangement, it's pretty obvious that all of the corners are exactly the same distance away from that center. So you just count up the number of corners you have. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's what you're going to have. Um, if you're dealing with a case where you have something that you're evaluating that's on the, uh, uh, that's on a boundary between one unit cell and the next unit cell, say, a, uh, an edge piece here in a face center cubic or a corner piece in all of these, then you need to be thinking about larger, uh, larger units where you can see the neighboring cells. So let me come back here. So, uh, trying to find the right one. Okay, we'll do this. So for simple cubic, just one of these corner cubes, or maybe the blue in here, we'll say, is our unit cell. We have to look at uh, one of the corners to determine how many nearest neighbors do we have. Well, uh, along one of the edges, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you see, uh, try to ask, are any of the others the same distance away? Well, if we go, go from here to here, that's across the face diagonal, which is longer than the side. Okay, this is square to two times the, uh, the side length. And the only other ones we see here are across the body diagonal, which is even further away. So in this case, the corner of a simple cubic lattice is going to be is going to have a coordination number of six because there are six nearest neighbors. That's the kind of process you have to go through in, in order uh, to determine coordination numbers of different lattice types. Okay, and with that, we've gotten through almost all of the questions on the list, and we are nearly out of time. So if there are some other questions from the live audience or from the chat, I'll, I'll stick around to answer one or two more questions. Uh, yes? 
still says homework two is disabled. Thank you for pointing that out. I will figure out what's wrong with that. Yes. Okay, the difference between induced dipole and dipole dipole. Induced dipole is where you have a, uh, an electron cloud that, uh, that has a dipole induced in it by bringing something charged or some kind of dipole or something like that up next to it, causing polarization. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me stop sharing the screen and switch there. Okay. So, uh, so an induced dipole is where you have something that is polarizable, meaning that you have some electrons in a cloud, and you bring something up next to it that is either going to attract or repel the, uh, the electrons. That process polarizes the cloud of electrons, inducing a dipole in it. Okay. Dipole-dipole interactions are where you have two permanent dipoles. So here's a dipole. We have another dipole like this. That is a dipole-dipole interaction because they have attractions in this orientation. Okay. Anything, any last other thoughts or questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll be looking for your group assignments um, and uh, keep adding points to the Monday's point list on Piazza. Uh, and I, I will try to be catching up on all of that over the next couple of days. Thank you all.